Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, today I am joined by the amazing James Marandino. James, how are you doing today, man? Good. How are you? Dude, I am doing so well. Um, yeah. Very excited to have you here. But before we talk about why you're here, James, I would like for the people that don't know you to get to know you a little bit. Okay. Um, James is an American movie director and screenwriter. He settled in Hollywood when he was 19 years old and began a tenure under Hollywood mogul uh, Dan Melnick in 1991. Um, your first motion picture, Witchcraft 4. Now, obviously, that's your first motion picture. Um, you started pretty much in the horror world then. Like, is yeah. horror something that's always been a big part of your life? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do horror. I, my, my, um, my, the main work that I've done is horror, uh, horror comedy, like dark, dark, dark uh dark comedy horror yeah yeah i mean well, that most of my movies are made up of that well uh, the great part about that is in every movie that you have there definitely is a darkness to it but yeah. something that you've brought light to which i think is amazing um a river made to drown in um, oh yeah that's a movie that was very pivotal to the gay community because richard chamberlain came out publicly after the film's release now yeah with something like that that's bigger than film, you know. So, yeah. what was it like to be a part of this movement? Of um, what River Made to Drown in? Um, I, I, I was, uh, I had just made this action movie called Livers Ain't Cheap, and then um, I was looking for another project, and the these um, producers came to me with that, and uh, I just felt like, to me, I just felt this is a story about how this man wants to leave a legacy. So mm -hmm. I, I, I did, you know, I don't. Um, I personally don't have like any, um, hangups about, you know, people that whatever, tra whether they're, you know, yeah. trans transgender or, um, LGBTQ, play none of that stuff, you know, I have no hangups about that. And that's not how I approach that movie. I approach the movie from, a, from an honest place of, of understanding this guy who wants to leave it, who's dying and he wants to leave a legacy to, um, you know, his young lovers. So that that sort of. So I don't. I don't know that I was trying to make a statement uh, with that. I think I was just trying to tell a good story. Um, I, I'm not really a soapboxer. Uh, I, I try to. Um, I try to just tell stories that I find interesting to me. So I'm not. You, you know, like because I mean, like if it, I just find that it, that I'm no good at di being didactic. You, you know, because I really usually don't know what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> So I, I try to. So even with like River Made to Drown, and it just the subject matter was that. But like, and I, you know, much of my crew were, um, were you know, gay and lesbian crew. Uh, so you know, so Richard was surrounded by all these young people that were out, and he, you know, so and it made him feel so comfortable. And he hadn't been out yeah. for his so long his of his life, and there are all these people that are just like young and really beautiful and they're out and, and everybody's accepting of each other. And he felt pretty good about that. So that's why he, I think he felt uncomfortable coming out then. Like, like, I think he literally said that he told me that he said that that's why he, he was, you know, he decided to come out. And I, and I said, Richard, I, I thought you were out. I didn't, I didn't even know. Like, you don't, <laughs> I, you, everyone knows, I think Richard, I <laughs> that it's right but um, at, at least you you gave him the strength and the power to come to terms with who he well was. i think it was so the crew i think it was the crew i think that the people he was working with the, the, you know that he felt because they were just they were all out and you know like really like um i mean like, like a, a large art department and and my groups were, I mean, was, were lesbians but like they're also like and and uh, and then like the producers were gay and i don't know everyone was sort of young and you know like and like not worried about being out at all like and so he was like why are you, how, why did i do this 20 years ago you know he kind of right. was like that you know and and of course 20 you know 20 years earlier had been not it wasn't good like it was a bad time for you know like it was a pre stonewall so i don't think that he would have you know, so I mean, I think he maybe he sort of lamented that you know he was, you know, like it had to take so long, you know, for it to be. But he, he looked around and said, "Oh, it's accepted now." I think that's what his attitude was. Right, and it's even more accepted today. But I mean, like you know, you know, in L.A., you know, in the nineties, I don't like you know, it was accepted. I th I think it was pretty accept widely accepted. And I mean, so much of my life, I have been accused of like you know of every possible 
thing, any slur, you know, like that, that has to do with being gay, you know, that um, I've always been able to relate to that, you know, that that community. So I don't know. I, I totally feel you there. I've always been the gay guy in our group, but I'm married. Yeah. And I still yeah. like that, you know. I mean, for, I, like, I, if, I, if I, somebody was beating me up and saying, you know, like for calling me gay, I'd be like, I, you should be okay. Yeah. Like, because right. like, well, I'm not going to like, you know, what's the difference? You know, like, right. It's not going to stop anything. No, no. And, and they have no right to do that in the first place. So I'm not going to like say, oh, you, why are you doing that? I'm not gay. Like, right. I think I even put that in SLC Punk. Kevin, that that's not like uh, that's um that's uh Eddie's thing. Like he's saying like he gets beat up for being gay, and they said like and he says he doesn't deny it because he doesn't care, you know, like that was sort of right. Weird. Well, that's the perfect segue, man, because I did obviously want to talk about SLC Punk a little bit. Obviously, <laughs> a movie that is super influential to me, and anybody that knows me knows this. Um, you know, Salt Lake City Punk released in 1998. Um, this movie blew my mind the first time I had seen it. Um, you know, everything from being learning about straight edge punks and, you know, learning about how much we hated Nazi punks and like all these things that I knew in my heart were being, you know, th this was my coming out, you know, like my yeah. coming out as a punk rock kid. And you know, I'm 12 years old when this movie comes out and I'm just blown away. I'm at such an influential age. And I, I would told you before the interview, I'd kind of already dipped my toes in punk rock with Angus. The soundtrack to Angus had a bunch of Green Day and Weezer and uh, stuff like that. And this movie pushed me over the edge. And my mom, bought, this is a true story. My mom bought me this soundtrack because watching the movie, it had her favorite song, a punk cover of it. And I never promised you a Rose Garden. Oh, yeah. And so my mom loved that punk rock version of it. And uh -huh. um, you learn watching this movie that punk rock is not the green hair or the studded jacket i mean um you have so many you know you have jason's character you know yeah. he's the most straight edge looking guy in the world the preppiest looking guy in the world but he's probably the most punk rock guy in the group yeah you know it's all about the love and the attitude and the energy and um growing up were you a big fan of punk rock growing up yeah, I mean, I I was uh, I was I was I was pushed into this sort of um, I was just a weird guy, so I was pushed into this sort of outsider. So that that was the only group that would like at that time accept me uh, were those guys were the, were punks, you know. So I mean, I I wasn't like a you know known in the scene in Salt Lake, whatever scene, whatever that means, but. Um, I, you know, I was, that was the scene that I was most associated with. I mean, in terms of like that, that I felt that I could be comfortable in, you know, because they weren't going to judge me. So, right. um, you know, they weren't going to give me shit about being gay. Like it's the, the jocks at school were doing that, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the, the, you know, the football players that thought they were cool or whatever. Um, it's so, uh, but that, you know, it's funny because the move that movie, I didn't make, when I made SLC Punk, I really, I, I made movies that went to festivals. I, I'm a festival director. So um, I, I made them. And, and at festivals, there was like, there were all like older people at those festivals. I'm in my 20s so I, at that time. Right. Like, they're, they're, they're all older people and uh, and older Hollywood. And I, w I felt that, you know, I got a lot of, I used to, I, I had this pet peeve of, of, of punks being portrayed when you want to show like a, a, a guy. When they wanted to show like like thugs in a in a subway, they they want to show like guys they, the you know, gang the members. Guys, they're punks, like you know, like yeah. just, you know, punks are guys with with switchblades, and and they're like, "What are you doing, man? I'm gonna cut you," you know, like and, and you're like, and I'm like, "That's <laughs> not that that's just there." You guys miss it. So I wanted to make a movie to show older people. That's why it's sort of generic. I always felt like that it was a generic because I didn't dive too deep in. So I've been accused of the movie being like sort of generic and like it's a tourist a, a version of punk rock. It's not really what punk rock, like it's not really like legitimately what they're seeing. It's like, well, I mean, like that criticism is interesting, but I really was trying to generalize it for an older mm -hmm. audience, you know, saying like, look, there's rebellion everywhere in every city. It's a youth movement. It's a youth rebellion. I was never trying to say, oh, you grow out of it. That was not my point at right. all. I was just saying that like these people are going to be your future. Uh -huh. You know, like and I was and I was speaking to baby boomers and silent generation people, right? Like I was speaking to older people and I was saying, yeah. 
you know, they, they they are going to be the future lawyers. They're going to be the future doctors. They're going to be the future politicians, whatever. Like eventually they would be. That was what I thought at the time. Again, I was naive in my 20s. I didn't know that. I thought that I didn't think that that movie would be seen by anybody outside of the festivals. So when it did start to leak, you know, like some people were supportive. Other people were like, this is a punk rock. And I got a lot of shit about it. And I was like, guys, I really didn't think you would even see it. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, like, really, I was just trying to, like, maybe just piss off a bunch of baby boomers, like, like, and say, like, because, because it, when I, when I showed the movie, it can for, for selling it, you know, which I thought I didn't have a shot in hell at selling it, because I thought it would be, you know, because I, I said, I remember I gave this speech saying, you know, there's this really important generation to me. Uh, it's the it's a, it's the, the hippie generation. They did a lot of good things. They they stopped Vietnam and all that stuff. And you know what? I don't give a shit about that. I'm making a movie about my generation, and then, and right. and that's what I said. And so I was really that was my sort of philosophy. That was my point of view on it. I didn't. I honestly didn't think that any punk would or any anybody younger than me or my age would like appreciate the movie at all. So Dude, it, it's become one of those movies that is so we just did a top 10 non-horror movies on our channel and almost everybody on the panel had SLC punk on that movie oh, because, or on that well, list. I mean, oh. because it, it's one of those movies that it is genre bending like and for any it doesn't matter what I love about this movie is you don't have to be a punk rock fan to have this movie touch you. You know, this movie yeah. is not about specific... It, the movie's called Salt Lake City Punk, guys. Obviously, there's a bunch of punk rock people in the movie. Um, but this but movie is just about, about finding yourself and being yeah. accepted. And yeah. yeah, it's about being an outsider. And yeah. the cast of this movie is fucking gigantic. Like, yeah. you had an amazing cast. And this movie, to me, is one of those, like you said, lightning in a bottle movies. You didn't expect anything of it. And, you know, I'm here in Sand Creek, Michigan at the age of 12. 13 watching this movie on vhs and just having my mind blown and right. it's fantastic and that led to the sequel punk's dead yeah. um which does still follow the mythos of heroin bob which i thought was great you were able to get him back that was amazing in a way to bring him back yeah um what was it like filming punk's dead Salt Lake city punk 2 well that was an interesting experience because that was sort of um that's a largely misunderstood movie. I, that was something that that for a while I had a lot of people saying, "You got to make a sequel. You got to make a sequel." And, and then when it came together, I had I, I wrote a script that was uh, with Lillard's character, Stevo, mm -hmm. and it was a big movie. It was going to take place all like in South America. And I mean, like it, in, in, we go to we find Mike in 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 Africa. You know, like I, it, you know, like getting involved with gorillas and stuff. I mean, like it, it really was like, I mean, not gorillas, but like gorillas, like the, you know, the the the, the Spanish word meaning warriors. Warfare. Yeah, 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 warlords. Like he meets like warlords and he gets on with them and stuff. So I, you know, like it, it's this whole it really. And then Heron Bob's kid ends up. It, it was a goth kid ends up in South America in jail because he thought he was like somebody stuck cocaine in his in his suitcase like to make him a mule so he ends up he has no idea and so he ends up going to jail so uh so steve-o who in the story went to law school but didn't become a lawyer uh because he dropped out because he got sick of harvard he thought it was all bullshit um mm -hmm. then they but he gets this emergency call so he goes to south america and he tries to you know he he represents in a in a uh i think it was uh colombian a colombian court um you know, uh, tries to represent the kid, right? And to get him out. So, and and it's just, you know, he does the whole Abby Hoffman thing where he writes fascist pig on his forehead and, you know, like, it, it, you know, he, he like, anyway, it, it becomes pretty fun. And they all end up in jail and and then, and then somebody gets them out. So, so it, it was like, <laughs> it was, it's a really fun script. And and then like, but when we came down to it, it's like, that's going to cost three, $4 million to make. And I, I couldn't get that kind of money. Like, right. it, you know, like independent cinema is, just didn't sell for what it used to sell. So I, and, and then, so I didn't want to like, you know, ruin that. I, I kept thinking in the back of my mind, well, I, could, I guess I could always still make this. I just don't want to destroy it. So instead I made it kind of a spinoff. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where Punk's Dead becomes this sort of spinoff, which is a, is a shorter movie. Um, and it was about the people who didn't leave Salt Lake. Right. Um, and you were able to get a lot of the cast to come back and be a part of it, which is, a, a, you know, almost 20 years later 
Yeah. These people, this movie still meant so much to them. They were willing to come back and take, you know, part in the spinoff world of watching heroin Bob's son try to find himself now yeah. as a young goth kid. So yeah. obviously that's an atonement to you and the direction you have and the script that you brought to them. So yeah. was I didn't think that, 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 there, was, back? there was some, that, well, they were all, everyone was very friendly and happy. I, I'm still friends with, I'm friends with Devin. I'm, I'm friends with Michael. Like, you know, I'm friends with Jimmy Duvall. These are my friends. So they were happy to come. Like uh, what was weird is that like, I think people reacted that they, they were ups, they, it, it annoyed people that he was a goth kid, and I thought, what's what do you guys care about that? You know, like because it wasn't a punk. He's not. He's, and oh, and then MGK people were weirded out about that because MGK. I didn't know who MGK was. He right. just is a guy that auditioned for me, and I was like, oh, this guy's great. He's got you know, he's like he's really into punk. He knew punk rock very well. His name was Colson. You know, like I didn't know that he was a rapper. I didn't know anything about that. Like that was not what I was not paying attention. I have never really paid much attention to new rap. I I, I do. I know the, the old school stuff. I love the old, like anything that's, that was new and, and abrasive, like I, and NWA and all that. stuff. I like all that yeah. stuff, but you know, but like, you know, white rapper, I was always like, you know, I, so I never, I wouldn't be a guy that would know who MGK was. Sure. And so he was an actor called Colson Baker. And he was like, and I, and so I was like, and they were telling me like, you know, he, he means something and, you know, and, and I guess I, I looked him up on, I, I looked, I, I casually looked up MGK on Twitter. I saw he had a lot of followers. I didn't, I didn't even bother to listen to anything. He, any of his music because I just, was I had to hurry up and make the movie. So I cast him and then a lot of people got mad. Like, how can you cast a rapper as a punk rocker? You know? And I was like, whoa, 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 right there is. That's the small-minded thing that you're trying to fight against. Yeah, and also like, and also on top of it, I'm like, no, no, no. He's an, I hired an actor. Like right. Matthew Lillard was in a punk man. Like when we when he came into audition for the movie, he was an actor. He said like, I don't not really a punk. You know, I mean, like he likes the music, but he wasn't like a punk. He's an right. actor. He's a very good actor. Very good actor, but like, an actor. You know, like and he we you know like but, you know and. Michael Gorgian isn't a punk, <laughs> you know. Like he, you know, like he's a good actor. So MGK <laughs> was just an actor that was in the movie. I wasn't really thinking like, and there were they just were conflating these things. I'm like, I, you know, because I, because I, I guess he's a polarizing individual. Um, and then he became started doing pop punk stuff, but you know, and everyone was like, how can you do that? I wasn't surprised at all because that's all he ever talked about. Like when I knew him was like, on the set was he liked punk. Like he, he was a drummer in a punk band and he was, he was just, he, I don't know how, I mean, he went direction of rap because I guess that was, he was good at it or something. Again, I don't know. It's not my, it's not my bag, you know? So I, right. I, uh, but when he was on set, he, I like, um, he, um, Brandon Steinecker, the drummer from Rancid gave him a guitar and he was, you know, he was playing like like he was playing Weezer songs and shit. Like he was into yeah. punk. He wanted to play punk stuff. He was playing like Ramones, and he, I, you know, like that was he was into. The, that's all I heard from him. And on his like, and, and when he would get ready for his scenes, all he had on his playlist were all punk bands like that. So I I don't know like I don't know. I just think it's funny because like I I don't I'm not interested in all that. So I I didn't care. I guess, it, but a lot of people still even now will say. You shouldn't. Why did you put MGK? They still say that. Why? Why did you? You? you they, why would you put MGK in a movie about punk? I'm like, I don't, I don't, like, I don't know, dude. I, you know, I, he was an actor. I, he, I don't know. Like, I, I think he's a nice guy. I, that, and that, he knows the punk rock scene, like you said. Like, and I, I agree with you because I've never been a huge MGK fan when it comes to his rap music and stuff. But I've known for a long time that Colson was a huge punk rock fan. He's made that very vocal for a very long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, just. And and also I the, I made also a point and maybe they didn't like it or not, I might I kind of try to redress the issue that everyone is accepted in that it's supposed to be, was originally accepted in that movement every I mean like maybe look a bunch of chuds came in and yeah. and definitely invaded the scene like like I I when I was going back and revisiting that stuff in the nineties I was like whoa yeah there's a lot of like like in the early two thousands. Like there's a lot of frat boys here, and I was like, "What the hell will happen?" You, you know, like, and they were all like, "It's bro, I'm gonna fucking," you, you know. And I was like, th th "Where are all the funny guys that were making this? Knew this was all funny, you know?" Because right. like a lot of that was supposed to be just funny, you know. Like it's the same way that you know the carpenter, no, the 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 the, the zombie picture, um, 
is punk rock in the mall. No, no is it? No, it's the, Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, it's not the mall, but it's, is it the, is it the, the mall? No, no, no. It's, it's the no. other one. It's the punk one. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, and, and that stuff was supposed to be funny. And I just didn't understand like where the, like, because like I remember in at the time it was like in Salt Lake City, it was really like anyone that was weird and different was again, like I said earlier, that's the scene you could go to and not really get a lot of shit. And so again, then I, you know, maybe some Nazi punk show up, but then they were like widely unaccepted and they would get kicked out. And I mean, like, you know, and it'd be all good fun. So uh, if, if you're, if you're doing stuff like that, that's still rooted in hate and punk rock's all about love and acceptance. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I literally, that's the sex pistols. They told me, Jello told me that they wrote that song, Nazi punks fuck off because there were jerks showing, starting to show up to their misinterpreting what they were into, right. you know, and, and just being like, you know, weirdly like trying just to pick fights and, and get, you know, and, 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 and like, not getting like slant a pit is not about fighting, you know. Right. It's, just, it's, about, it's just about like living, you know. Like, yes, man. So, so you don't um, want to hurt anybody when you're out no, there. No, no. In fact, they're probably they're sometimes very, you know, if it's a good pit, you know, people are very helpful. You know, like if you fall yeah. down, like they get you, pick you up. If you jump off the stage, they catch you. They're gonna catch but, you. Yeah, yeah, they got you. <laughs> you know, so like you know, because if you have the balls to go in a good pit, then there people are pretty, you know, like nice about it they're supposed yeah. to be you know but then you'll get into like where people got too drunk and some maybe some assholes showed up and then fights break out and that's i you know that's i'm not down with any of that so no. i kind of tried to put a little bit of that in a punk stand and i think they thought i was they they said it kind of i kind of wimped out and you know i, I wasn't it wasn't as macho as, as the first one i don't you know whatever i didn't really care but like that's you know that's what happened so whatever you know i you know you, i just make movies man so <laughs> it's supposed to be entertainment it's supposed to be yeah. for fun and i yeah. love that how you say you know oh well, matthew lillard isn't punk and no one talks shit about that watch yeah. the movie before you judge the movie man that's all yeah. i'm gonna say yeah um but you know talking about these movies that have meant so much to me growing up is super special but what i want to talk about is a movie that meant a lot to you growing up james so yeah i want to go back to the past and talk about what got you started in the horror genre your first horror movie and James, the first horror movie you watched was The Exorcist. Absolutely. I mean, there might have been something before that, but The Exorcist is the only one I can remember. It's all one of the only movies I can remember from my childhood because it was so traumatic. Like it was. Yeah. So, first off, okay, so I'm living in Salt Lake City and I'm Catholic, right? So I'm growing up Catholic. I'm, I I I was Catholic till I reached the age of reason. So, which is a the, that's a George Carlin thing. So, but line. So, so I I was. Um, so, you know, to protect me from, um, you know, the, the, the predominantly Mormon influence in, in public schools where there was a little bit of a, I mean, literally like in, in a class when I was in, in elementary school, uh, one of the teachers was saying that Catholics worship Satan to the class, you know, because they worship the cross, whatever. And I was like, well, uh, I'm from New Jersey. Like I just got there from New Jersey and I was like, That's bullshit. You know, and I got, you know, and I got in trouble, you know, and, and so I, I was suspended. And my parents, like, you know, this is a problem. So as a result, they immersed me into Catholic schools, yeah. uh, you, you know, which was a very small community. But, you know, like, the, you know, again, we're Italian American. So there was Italian Day at the amusement park and we stuck pretty close to that community. So now, OK, so they've got all this Catholic guilt and all this Catholic imagery in my head and it's Italian Catholic. So. Um, and I'm young, so I'm still buying all that. And then uh, I, and then with my friend, we sneak into the re-release. I think it's '77 or '78 of The Exorcist, not the the original. I was way too, sure. I was a baby when it first came out. But when it, you know, so I'm like eight or seven or eight years old, um, maybe nine. But like, yeah, because I started going to like catholic stuff so like i was like nine maybe ten so i go to the re-release and and, and uh, we sneak in yeah so i'm already feeling guilty that we snuck into the <laughs> we, we bought tickets to the harbor valley bts some other fucking i don't know what movie and we snuck into the exorcist and i sit down and the and we're just hiding and watching it so i'm really getting glimpses of it and it is so aggressive it is so outside of my age like that I should be watching this it is it's conjuring images 
that are supposed to be sacred, right? Of like, you know, defiling, like, you know, the statues, like putting, putting penises on them and, you, you know, like, and you're just like, oh my God. And the, and the, and the, you know, she, uh, her like whole thing and the medical stuff that was going on in that, like where she's, which my dad's a doctor. So like the whole thing where she's like, was taken in and they put that thing in her neck and the blood comes out. And like, I'm like, oh my God, I, now I'm still afraid of doctors because of that movie. Um, you know, like, you know, like, and uh, just like the sort of all that imagery and all that stuff was just like, just traumatizing, you know, like just, and then like, she's like, your mother, you know, like, she's like, fuck me Jesus and taking a cross and like, you know, yeah. like it's just like from a Catholic little Catholic boy point of view, that was fucking. And then all I thought is like, I'm going to get possessed. And so like for months I couldn't sleep because I thought like a demon was going to possess me. And, and the, the, I, the, so I, the story I always tell is that what came out of it was that my father's hat owns a clinic at the ski resort and a, and effects one of the guys from the, like I think the effects, the main effects guy, was on the movie. Um, the practical effects uh, was got injured, and so he was in he, like broke his hand or something. So in my dad said he said, oh, "What do you do?" And he said, "I did, like for instance, I do effects of the Exorcist." Oh well, my son's actually really struggling with that. So then, like they kind of have this guy. They they bring him. The guy comes over with like pictures of the city. Like this is a crew. It was all fake. This is how it worked. And I was like, that's what I, and that's when I said, I want to do that. I want right. to do what that guy does. So that's how, that's why I ended up making movies is because of, because of that whole experience. Um, you know, it's because like th that, that was the moment I realized this is a very powerful medium, mm -hmm. you know, like um, that, like, you know, I mean, it can really, really get into your head. So, so, um, and then when you realize you know, he like the, the most important thing he said to me because I was so scared. He said, "You know that she was on that that everybody that, that's there before the takes, they're laughing, and every there's a whole like there's like fifty to a hundred people standing around them. They're not alone. You know all that stuff. Like it's they, 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 there's a whole crew there. You know, like so when you're looking at the screen, it's not like just them alone on the screen. You know, in this room like you think because I'm a little kid. I'm thinking that I don't realize sure. a crew there. So so in explaining all that stuff as I'm like, God, yeah, I want to do that. You know, you're like, I want to be on those sets and do, doing that. So, so, um, you know, that, that's what happened. And it's, I, and it's funny because even now I still get a little nervous about watching the movie and it's just because of, you know, the trauma, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, cause I guess I was too young to be watching it, but, uh, I remember somebody telling me that, um, Schlesinger, uh, the, the director, the, the gay Jewish director, British director, went to see the movie when he saw the movie with his with his partner um they just laughed the whole movie because there's absolutely nothing in that movie that would what about that movie i i mean like first off they're in, he's an intellectual uh right. he's gay and he's jewish so there's nothing in that movie that is other than campy to him you know like sure. the, the girl is going fuck me jesus you know like that you know like jesus you, you, i mean you know <laughs> you know <laughs> So the prophet, like, yeah, right. I mean, like the you know, Messiah, yeah, like you know, like nothing. To, you know, so I'm like, I was like, God, that's really interesting. I didn't even think about like, yeah, what what would it mean to a Jewish kid? You know, like it, right? It's so heavily reliant on your your you know like understanding of of Catholic or Christianity. You know that that it, that's that's where it would hit you. But I mean, if you're raised like, even if you were Muslim, you might still be scared of that because it's got all the same sort of scary satan stuff but like if you're a hindu or jewish or jewish or whatever i mean i guess it could be scary but not as scary i don't think like you know like if you're raised without that fear of like without the paranoia of jesus and satan and stuff like that I don't, you know going I don't, to hell yeah i just or just just like or you know the sacrilegiousness of you know saying that you know fuck me jesus you know like that that doesn't mean much to a hindu person or or you know or, or to, you know like <laughs> You know, like it's like, so what? <laughs> you know? Right. So I don't know. Um, so, so, but for me though, it was it, it was like that because of my upbringing at that time. No, and what I what I love about what you're saying is you're completely right. If you had never even heard the gospel or heard the word of Christ, this movie may not mean anything to you. 
but yeah i mean like i guess like like in theory you could be i guess the the idea of of demons is scary and demons possessing you is scary i guess you know Mm -hmm. um you know just because like it's supernatural it's you know but but it is so like i mean it's this priest you know which is i i've reflected on it and i'm like okay so there's this priest and if i'm looking at it from an outsider now like from not so christian right and i'm thinking like there's this priest who is having doubts right that's father father marion no not father marion uh, father Karras is having he's he's doubting his vocation he's not sure that he believes in god he's having a, a crisis of faith right so all that stuff means something to in 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 Christianity. Um, so he encounters a, a a a person that is that is possessed by a demon and becomes convinced that he needs to exercise it, and so that he gets the help of Van Cedal, who is only like forty. Uh, and yeah, I mean, he, he looks like he's eighty, right? I never understand. <laughs> Weird, right? Because he's a young guy. So I mean, like. But anyway, so he he because he, the movie came out in seventy three, was shot in seventy two. So, mm-hmm. so um, so he comes to help him, and and I just were thinking like, okay, they're sitting downstairs, and everything's very serious, and they're very dour, and they're depressed, and it's scared, and everyone's scared, and then and then you and then you realize for a minute, wait a minute, but upstairs is proof that you're right. right. Why aren't you celebrating? <laughs> you know, like like if this if you believe that that the devil is upstairs. Then you believe that they, that God is that, that's a that's an Elmer Gantry line, you know. He says like, "How do I know there's an all loving, powerful God? Because I've seen the devil many plenty of times, mm-hmm. right? Like that that's an old like old timey religious thing to say. So like, you, you can't have one without the other. Yeah. So I mean, like if if they're up there is this demon, I guess it's um, Pazuzu is upstairs mm-hmm. possessing, the, which by the way, Pazuzu isn't even a demon. Pazuzu was a, is a Sumerian protector uh, against demons. Um, I've recently found this out. So, so like, <laughs> so I'm like, they so it's a crock of shit. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, You're still justifying to your yeah. Pazuzu self. doesn't possess people. Pazuzu had Pazuzu. There's a there's a female counterpart to Pazuzu that is is a, is a demon of the wind, a Sumerian wind demon that is does is a, a, a scary but pazuzu like they would use that pazuzu imagery to scare away the demons okay. so uh he, pazuzu was an anti-demon or whatever like whatever like it's sumerian so i don't know i forget what they call it like an anti like a demigod but sure. um that's beside the point anyway you got you got you got proof the supernatural go home you win way to go <laughs> game over <laughs> you, you win, you, your faith christ is the faith gone over you were right <laughs> that's amazing man so, so we're talking about this movie which is like i said this is the only movie as a little boy my mother shut off she was like nope too much not doing this you can't watch this yeah so i do have that stigma around this movie as well but when you have little james sitting in the movie theater watching this film which scene do you think it was that shook you the most um honestly when she pisses the carpet I, I don't know why, but like it just like because it was so like whoa, this yeah. is like wh- like what the f-? she says you're gonna die up there, and she pisses the carpet, <laughs> and I was just like I mean now I think that's kind of ridiculous, but like at the time it was like oh my god like that because I just felt like she was just so completely out of control like they like you know like because then it, then it just starts getting crazy it, it, then it becomes like sensory overload and I just sort mm-hmm. of become traumatized where I don't even remember what was happening. Like when her head spun around, I think I closed my eyes because I didn't see it. I don't remember it happening. You, you know, like from that, from when it, it just got too much. But like yeah. that moment was like, so I'm co- I'm cognitive of what's going on. Also, like there's a divorce theme in that story, mm-hmm. right? Which subconsciously, like you don't know when you're a kid, but I mean, that's what that movie is kind of about is like what divorce does to kids, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, because like, if you watch it, and you evaluate it like she, Reagan hears her mom arguing about how her husband is missing an action. Her ex husband is not there for her birthday. I think right. that's what it is. Like she's like, well, you know, like more, you know, Reagan needs to see you. Like there's a, there's an argument, and she's upset. Is her mom's upset? And Reagan is listening before 
you know, Mr. Howdy is taking her over, whatever his, his name is. Mr. Howdy? Yeah. So he he's like, um, I think this is right, right? So she she first hears that and then she becomes possessed. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's sort of it's sort of like an allegory for sort of like like uh reacting to this, you know, she she finds a new father, Mr. Howdy, right? You, you know, and it's and it's you know, like and it's sort of this idea of like the trauma of divorce for kids. And, you know, since all we were going, my family was probably going through a, a divorce at the time. So like, and so many people were, so I, maybe that was also like thrown on to me too, a little bit. I don't know. Like it just said, it probably was. So there, there was like, um, so, I mean, like, so there's a lot of layers to that, that, that you don't realize till later on, like that, that I, until I understood cinema, that, that a lot of horror, good horror movies are really about something else. Right. Um, I mean, but they're done in a way that they become surreal. They're they're good ways of expressing certain things in a surreal fashion, so that you can get to the emotional point of it. Like how The Exorcist is about like child abuse. Mm-hmm. Not The Exorcist. I'm sorry. Also The Exorcist, but also The Shining. Yes. Is about you know spousal and and child abuse, right? And but for the alcoholism. point alcoholism. Yeah, man. For the point of you know, well, a, 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 yeah, alcoholic father who who is a dry drunk. Who is literally like beating the shit out of everybody? But from the point of view of a kid, so everything is surreal. Everything is like it's a horror movie, so everything is 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 like it becomes expressionistic. Everything is like you know warped. So you can tell. So you can horror is a good medium to tell a story like that, but be able to do it in a way that gets to the emotional, like you know, to, to to be able to really express it emotionally without being maudlin or you know overly dramatic to where you're like, yeah, this is just a grief fest. You know, sure. you, you know, you can you can present it as like, oh my, it's like blood coming out of the elevator, and you know, and there's there's like you know, you know, and like I'm gonna bash your brains in, you know, and and then getting like there's like weird like you know people like like ghosts partying and shit, like you, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff because it's surreal, like you, you know, like because if you're in an abusive situation where you cannot escape. Because that's also a part of when you're you're in it, you find yourself in an abusive relationship, you can't escape it. Um, so they're in this cabin, they can't can't get out of this this hotel, they can't leave. Um, and she's supposed to protect her kid, and this the entire experience is surreal. So that's sort of like I feel like in the exes like is the same kind of thing, like you know, has has a sub subtext to it. So and it's one of the things where um like you said, with The Shining, with The Exorcist, these are also two movies that really, really stick with people and make people realize how scary horror can be because it's real life horror. And this yeah. year we're getting a reboot to The Exorcist. Is that something that you're excited about? Wait, they're doing it again? Who's yes. who's who's doing it? Um, they're doing it with Blumhouse. Uh, they're doing a three part, and it's a uh, it's a requel, just like Halloween 2018. It takes place however many years after the events of The Exorcist. Um, it's coming out late. I think October is its slated release date. Are they getting um, Linda Blair to play? Linda Blair hasn't come back yet, but her mom is back so far. Uh, uh, Bernstein? Or Ellen, Ellen, is it, yeah, Ellen Bernstein. Who's one of the greatest actresses of all time. Ever. Um, it, like, Alice doesn't live here anymore. Wow. You know I mean? Like, she's just amazing, right? Like, so... I. Yeah. Uh, they, got, they also, by the way, they got great actors for that movie too. So that's also a part of it. And Max von Sydow and her, I mean, like these are great actors. So she's coming back. So she's going to be a very old lady. Yes. And like I said, I'm, I'm from what I've read, it's going to be a trilogy, just like they did with Halloween. Yeah. And it starts however many years after the events of the first one. It completely erases two, three, four, and five, which... Bummer. I oh no! Yeah, the so the Borman thing with the and and then also like the third one, which is awesome. Where he my was favorite, in, one of my favorite was, movies of all time. Yeah, it's so great. The third one is so great. I mean, it's better than the Roger. It's better than the Borman, uh, where they're in Africa. It's it's, it's better than that. Like it, the third one is just is just great. Like he's he's they bring Karis's in this like, insane yeah. asylum and is it George C. Scott? Yes. Yeah. God, it's so good. Yeah, he's the lead police officer in the movie. That, yeah, it was weird because he went through. He did a few horror movies around that period because he also was in the Changeling, right? So like, the Changeling, yeah, yeah another he, movie that has been bid on so many times. The ball coming down the stairs. Like, oh, the movie's so awesome, man! That movie's it's awesome. amazing. Yeah. Um. Now I know 
what your first horror movie was, James. And I know that The Exorcist means so much to you, but my little buddy Ghostface is here now, James, and he has a question for you. Uh, What's your favorite scary movie, James? <laughs> oh, what is your favorite horror movie of all time? Uh, like the one I have get the most joy from? Yeah. Yep. Just your absolute favorite. <laughs> the most joyous horror movie. <laughs> well, the let's one work that, this way. Let's the say one that you're taking a three-hour plane trip and you can only take one film with you to watch. It has to be a horror film. What's your plane ride horror film? I have a few because, I mean, would you consider Silence of the Lamb a horror movie? 100%. Jaws? 100%. This is some of my favorite movies of all time. So, you know, like, uh, how about like, even though he's problematic, whatever, he's problematic, but like Polanski made some of my best, the best horror movies I've ever seen. And also like the humor of them are like, mm -hmm. is my humor, right? So like, it's a shame that the guy's got this like horrible thing that he did. Um, but, uh, you know, Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's Baby. Repulsion and The Tenant, the, you know, the, 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 they're called the, 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 um, apartment trilogy oh my god those three movies are like awesome like those are like i i, I you know, like just and funny too like it's like, so like i like to me like there's comedy i know like comedy it's polanski comedy so it's great uh and also De palma does like great hard too like um so i don't know like you, you're asking me to pick that i really make a hard choice because then also because there's this different genres too because yeah. i mean i don't know if i put jaws in the same genre of the coen brother or not the, the Raimi like the, the like the evil dead, dead too you know i i say coen brothers because i know they helped out but um <laughs> yeah the, the sam raimi uh shaky cam stuff and um or even like the slasher stuff like uh texas turns on massacre uh, so which i mean it's slasher but there's not much blood in it is there um uh so i don't know so i mean like and i even like some of that new stuff that that guy from um a24 does um oh ari aster yeah yeah, yeah. i mean like, i don't i'm not like crazy about these endings i don't know what they i almost feel like i want to help them out and go like listen you know like endings i got, I got i'm really good with it. i got some good ideas for endings you know and and like you know i just i just feel like you know like heredity her, heredity right was um hereditary hereditary uh, was a great movie but like the ending was like oh man you know like i just feel like Wow, that, the ending didn't like it was a Rosemary's Baby ending. I was like, okay, well, you know, Very and, then, and, then, and then, but it also just didn't. I don't know. I didn't like grab me. Uh, and then, and then his other one, um, um, the Rom Springer thing, uh, Midsummer. Midsummer. Yeah, it, it's good. It's fun. You know, like, and I liked it. He, like, gave the Swedes a really hard time. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because, like, I, I, I was going to make a movie in Sweden. I had to keep going to Sweden. And, and like, they're funny people, you know, like, in Sweden, you know. Um, yeah. So I, I'm sure they took offense to some of that, you know. <laughs> but uh, I think I even heard them take offense to it. But, you know, it's funny about Sweden. Nothing to do with movies is that, that they're really into bingo. Really? Bingo parlors are a big thing in Sweden. Yeah. I don't know if it's still, like, but, yeah. Yeah, bingo parlors are a big thing. Um, anyway, I don't know. So I don't know why you left it out. But um, you know, I oh Troll Hunter is like what well, I love Troll Hunter. Um mm -hmm. the mockumentary Troll Hunter. Sure. Yeah, the Norwegian um trolls, you know, like <laughs> you know, um I don't know if Man Bites Dog is considered horror, but like I fucking love that show yeah. too. Um I think Blair Witch is good. I think they did a really made a really great movie with that. Um I think uh, Paranormal Activity was a good movie. Uh, so I don't know. So if you're talking, that's my favorite. Um, I guess today it's Jaws. Jaws. Jaws is such an awesome movie. You can't go wrong with Jaws. Jaws to me is such an influential movie that, and I've talked about this before. There's three films that come to my mind that are so goddamn good and so influential the people that have never seen the movies know the score. And that's yeah. Halloween, yeah. Psycho, and yeah. Jaws. Yeah. You know, like these three movies, that's how influential and important these movies are. 
that yeah. if you've never seen these films, you know the score of these films. And that's when you're hitting on every facet of a Well, film. okay, I, I would say that Halloween's, like, that hit, John Carpenter's little piano thing is, like, mm -hmm. one of the scariest, most effective, like, that shit's awesome. Yeah. I think that's just awesome. Like, you yeah. open up with that song and the music and slowly panning, you know, uh, pushing into the pumpkin it's just brilliant like like mm -hmm. I, i'm i was scared from that moment on. like like but it's i mean for me, but for me jaws though is like transcends just being scary because then it becomes like this sort of hemingway thing you know the old man in the sea where like they're out there on the you know like it starts out it's a hot, solid horror movie with a, with a with a monster in the ocean but then it becomes like no it becomes actually that they're going out to to stop the fish so it's a couple genres i think so, so I, it's hard to say that it's just hard um whereas halloween is definitely like that's good stuff halloween is good. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's 100 percent horror so um, yeah i've had an amazing time talking to you about some of the things you've done your first horror film some of your favorite horror films but before i let you go james i have one more question for you uh, we're yeah. going to bounce back to the exorcist and what we're going to do is rank this movie on a skull count. Now, we got to take your director and writer cap off because we're not judging it on direction, writing. Uh, we're not judging it on acting, production. We're not being critics. What we're doing is strictly judging The Exorcist on how much it affected you on your first viewing. So zero skulls being not effective, five being extremely effective. You can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. Uh, what would your ranking of The Exorcist be? Six skulls. <laughs> It fucking like traumatized me. Well, and you talk about effectiveness. See, I'm always thinking ahead. You know, I'm always playing chess in my own brain. And earlier, when you were talking about watching this movie and then learning about the practical effects and learning that this movie made you want to be the director writer that you are today, how could this be anything less than that? Yeah. If you had not snuck into this movie, if you would have gone, to see, you know, no, the Harper Valley PTA instead, yeah, you know. You may not be the guy sitting here talking to me right now. No, I don't know that I would have made music. Yeah, that was that was the thing that, that that did it. Yeah. So I mean, like you can't. It changed my life. Like, and and it was it was and it was, you know, like I mean, like anything. It was it was hard. Yeah. You know, like like ironically, a movie was it was a difficult time for me. <laughs> and that movie. I'm just. I'm glad you did. I'm glad that ten year old James stumbled in that movie theater because without that ten year old James stumbling into that movie theater. 12, 13-year-old Ken would have never seen Salt Lake City Punk. This yeah. podcast would not be happening right now. No. I made a, you know, butterfly effect, man. So yeah, yeah. Um, I do want to remind everybody, I didn't say it at the beginning because I was so nervous and excited. Yes, after 400 episodes, guys, I still get nervous and excited about these guests. But all of James's social media links are down in the description. So make sure you're following him on social media because he does have his mockumentary dark series coming out called Great it kills which will be released yeah. this year so you can stay up to date on that and the other things that he has coming up in the future by following him on social media so uh james please don't go anywhere i got a couple more questions for you okay uh, everybody else as always if you haven't already please like and subscribe follow sledgehammer horror on social media we'd love to have you along for the ride so you can stay up to every date on everything we're doing as well but until next time keep talking horror stay what you are and we'll see you guys soon